So we ended chapter two, Colossians chapter two. We were talking about um, towards the end, just what um, Paul was really trying to make the distinguish the difference between um, tradition, like following traditions and laws and all of the different um, philosophies of the day. And I was really trying to get people to let go of the traditional things. And it's towards the end of the chapter, we had this talk about how there were these rules about don't touch this, don't eat that, and this self-imposed bodily affliction and doing all these things to make it look like you're holy, but you're totally not. You're just doing these outward things. And so, so at the end of last month or the end of cha the chapter two, you know, Jesus is really, Paul is really focusing on the freedom Jesus has given us, the freedom from the physical world and freedom to live fully in the spiritual world. And so that was like a really smooth transition I saw from chapter two to chapter three, especially since Paul, you know, he didn't write with these separations. It's a long letter. We're putting these in. So after he denounces all the physical, traditional man-made rules and the self-imposed acts of piousness, Paul says, like, we need to transcend, we need to rise above these physical ties to religion and really focus on the spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ. Let go of the physical sins that enslave us to this world and reach above, like, the carnal satisfactions of this world to, like, more of a spiritual satisfaction. And, um, uh, Lorinda said in the beginning, but if you guys have comments, I'm really going to encourage us to kind of write your questions down. I'm going to have some questions dispersed throughout the lesson so you can write a note or two so we can talk about them at the end. And um, when I was thinking about like this carnal satisfaction versus spiritual satisfaction, I was just thinking about that term because we don't really think about that a lot. Like, um, spiritual satisfaction like what does that really imply and what does that look like spiritual satisfaction we know what carnal satisfaction is um but spiritual satisfaction is something different and like in the midst of a pandemic and in the midst of all this spiritual unrest and political wars how do we keep smiling like not to mention any personal physical financial or other problems that are going on in our lives how do we maintain spiritual satisfaction? How do we maintain peace in our hearts? One of my favorite verses I, is Isaiah 26 and 3, and I think I'm going to refer to it again later, but it says, you will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast on you because he trusts in you. I love that verse because that's where our peace is. The more we can keep our mind focused on God, the more peace we have, the more we can trust in God and not with everything else that's going on in this world, the more peace we have. And so this, the theme of this chapter, I chose put on Christ. Um, as you see in this picture, just putting on or clothing ourselves with the characteristics of Christ. And so can I just push this? Will it go to the next one? No. All right. I'm trying to get my controls. Here we go. So I was thinking again, spiritual versus carnal satisfaction. It's, it's more important and I believe more long lasting and satisfaction, satisfying to reach for that spiritual satisfaction more than the carnal satisfaction because every carnal satisfaction has a beginning and the end. I love candy bars and I, it's very satisfying when I eat it, but it, there's an end to it, right? It's, it ends unless I'm gonna go and get another candy bar it ends, whatever we have that's carnal satisfaction, it wears off, right? You buy a new car, you go on a vacation, um, whatever it is, it's exciting and it satisfies us, but there's a beginning and there's an end to it. You buy a new dress, it's great, but eventually the newness wears off and it's not as satisfying. But in this verse, John 4 verse 13, it says, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Oh, misspelled word. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up 
to eternal life. And I, you know, when I think about that, that's, that's the difference. And I, I never thought about like, you know, thirst, it starts, it stops, we get thirsty, we have to go get more. But spiritual satisfaction is always, always new. It's always satisfying to us as long as we're going for it. So I was thinking, okay, what's, the, what's missing in this spiritual thirst? So in order to satisfy something, you have to have the thirst, right? So we have to have spiritual thirst for God to, um, for us to be able to satisfy it or for God to, to satisfy it. So uh, you can't satisfy something if there's no desire or no thirst for it. Like, like I don't really like water. I don't really get thirsty. So I have to tell myself to drink water. So it's not satisfying. It's just something I know I'm supposed to do. So it's more like a chore that I have to drink water. Um, and I'm thinking that even sometimes Christianity is that way some, for some people. It's a chore. It's something I know I'm supposed to do. So I do it. So you're not satisfying something inside of you spiritually because you don't have a thirst. You're just doing it because you know you're supposed to do it. Okay, um, <laughs> I got two screens going here. So my first question that I want you guys to think about, kind of write an answer to that we can talk about later. Um, how is spiritual hunger and thirst increased? Um, just something to think about. How is it increased? I want you to think about this and some other questions that I'm gonna have throughout the lesson that we can discuss further. So it's not like physical thirst and hunger, which the body is going to automatically tell you, hey, you're hungry, you need to go eat something. Hey, you're thirsty, you need to get something to drink. Spiritual thirst and hunger is different, right? It's a craving. Um, if I don't eat a candy bar, I'm not going to die. If I love candy bars, when I see one, I want one, but it's different. Um, so then I was, you know, I was writing this and I think of certain people who don't seem to have any spiritual desire, like they're just going through the motions of Christianity. And, and I think that's an important point. How do we increase this spiritual thirst? Okay, so let's jump right into the lesson. So I wanna read Colossians chapter three, one through four. Uh, this next slide. Okay. So it says, since then you have been raised with Christ. I'm gonna have to read it here because it's cut off up there. <laughs> since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to the earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. And I highlighted for you that, well, there's, even before then, I think there's some things in here that just can't be done without the Holy Spirit. You know, the first thing, set your mind and your heart on things above. It says, don't think on earthly things. I mean, that's kind of a contradiction. How do we do that? How do we set our minds and don't think about earthly things? There's so many things. What does that mean? How do you do that? And, and I think it's impossible physically. It's impossible carnally. We need the Holy Spirit. It's only through the Holy Spirit that we can achieve what this verse is talking about. Um, verse five, well, so for you died, and verse five says put to death. Like, do we really put to death these things or you know, do we just kind of push them to the back of the closet? Because in order to like totally kill something, you have to remove it like, and replace it with something else. So that's why Paul, in this chapter, he then goes on, he gives a whole list of things that we need to rid ourselves of, and then gives a list of what we should replace them with. But just thinking about this verse, carnally, I think is really difficult to just not think about and not worry about things that are in, going on in the world. But having the Holy Spirit and, and, and having the Holy Spirit 
remind you to focus on God and to, and to remember the words of, of God and the words of in the Bible will help with that. So, cause I don't, I don't think that, um, I was thinking about, it. I don't know that sinful desire ever like really totally dies. And I'm just thinking of myself. And I think about if I, if I think about the things that I'm supposed to be dead to, like they can quickly become enjoyable again. But then I can look at other parts of my life and see where like previous sins have been replaced by godly things. So that makes me think that put to death is not a finite thing. It's not kill it and it's gone. Like you kill an animal or you kill a person and it's gone no more, never to come back again. I think putting to death is a process. It's a continual putting to death those parts of you that uh, can lead you to sin. So that immediately made me think of this passage, uh, 1 John 1 verse 7. But if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And the reason I love this verse is because it shows the continual cleansing of Jesus Christ's blood. It's not a one time you were cleaned upon baptism, never to be cleaned again. It's a continual thing. And so I was thinking that putting to death is a continual thing. It's not something that just happens once and you never have to do it again. And then another passage uh, is uh, Romans 8 verse 13 and it says for if you live after the flesh you will die but if you through the spirit put to death the deeds of the body you will live and again i like this verse because it's really highlighting um did it again uh, it's highlighting the spirit the need for the spirit then we need that in our body to accomplish this continual putting to, putting to death okay Things keep moving on my screen. Okay, so here's this question. Another question for you to think about, to write about, maybe have an answer for, or we can discuss later. When we know that dying to self is a process, how might this help in our relationship with others? Hmm, something to think about. If we know that it's a continual thing, how will this help in our relationship with other people? Okay, next slide. So here's the list of um, putting to death that Paul gives. And the first ones are obvious, I guess. <laughs> Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, idolatry. But I wanted to focus on, in addition to those, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language, and, and lying. Because as we all strive to be Christ-like, we are aware of the physical things we're not supposed to do. I think that it's more difficult to identify these um, spiritual or these, these sins that can crop up and we think we put them to death, but we really haven't. We've just maybe covered them up or made them look like something else or we push them to the back like anger and rage and you know malice or just bitterness. Have you ever just talked to somebody and every time they say anything, it's negative? Everything, they, you know, it's just they, they never have anything positive to say about anybody. You know, that's, that's sin. <laughs> that's a sinful attitude that some, we need to work on. You know, slander, always having negative words, always being very judgmental, negatively judgmental of other people. Those are sins as well. Those are things that we need to put to death and work on to put them to death so that we can replace them with the other uh, fruit of the spirit that Paul is talking about. Filthy lying and language, which again, I think we are, we are aware of. But other ways, things that creep into our conversations that we don't pay attention to that are things that need to be put to death. And I bring attention to them because there are things that I've had to work on of not always, um, even in my head, just being judgmental of some other person for whatever reason. Um, and we can think negative thoughts without realizing those are sinful thoughts, you know? And we have to bring those things under control to force ourselves to think about positive 
alternatives, positive options towards another person. Um, so we're not gonna go through all of the, the positives um, that he's talking about, but I wanted to go now to, I like this verse, verse 10, after he talks about the things we, put, we need to put to death, verse 10 says, and you have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. And I, I stopped and I thought about this verse. Our new spiritual self is re being renewed through knowledge of into the image of the creator. And I never really thought about that. The no so basically, the more knowledge you have, the more, the more you grow in knowledge of Christ, of Bible, of the characteristics, the more your image looks like Jesus Christ. Now, that's, that's kind of crazy to me. It's just, it just kind of blows my mind a little bit because like recently I went and I just bought a couple of uh, items of clothing, some shorts and some tops or whatever, summer clothes. And I, probably you're like me, but I love putting on new outfits. It, I don't care if it's a t-shirt, but it's new and I have nowhere to go, but I like the feeling of looking new, of having something. I was so excited to come home with my little t-shirt and look, when am I going to wear it with what? just because it's new. And I was thinking about that, that our spiritual self is always in a state of looking new when we learn something new from God's word. So studying God's word is like shopping for new clothes. It's like when we learn something new from God's word, it's like putting on a new dress. You know that feeling of when you put something new on. Man, it would be great if when you learn something new from scripture, or when you're, you hear something that makes you think differently about something, that you wear that for a minute. Like anything you, like for today, this lesson, maybe something hit you, you never thought about it before, whatever it is. It, and later on today, you put that piece of clothing on again and feel the newness of your spirit growing because you have learned something new from God's word. I think that's awesome. Um, I think that it's just a way, another way to appreciate the characteristics of God that maybe you weren't aware of before. And these characteristics that are available to you to put on, these pieces of clothing that are available to you to put on every single day. So every single day you can feel new because you have a new spirit. It's it's 2 Corinthians 4 and 16, which says, therefore, we don't give up, though our bodies are dying, our spirit is being renewed every day. I just wanted to make that comparison between most women love putting on new clothes. Well, we have an opportunity to feel new because we have new spiritual characteristics that we can put on every day. It just made me smile. And then um, verse 11 just talks about that there is no division, like we all belong to Christ. And in Christ is, we all belong to Christ and in Christ is in all of us who have put on Christ in baptism, right? So there's no black or white, Republican, Democrat, educated, uneducated, right side, left side. We are all in the same body, receiving the same blood of Jesus in our veins. The same living water is offered to all of us. That's what verse 11 is talking about. Verse 12 says, I like verse 12, therefore as God's chosen people, holy and, I think I wrote down something wrong, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves. Here it is, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. So put on <laughs> the clothing that piece of clothing of compassion, kindness, put those things on, wearing Christ, putting on Christ. So therefore we all ought to strive to look the same in spiritual characteristics. And sometimes I think, well, that would be kind of boring if we all look the same. But spiritually, we're all striving for our spirit inside of us to look more like Jesus Christ. So yeah, we all should 
be looking the same spiritually. Like my soul is uniquely mine, you know, with its carnal likes, dislikes, personal challenges, personal gifts, whatever it is. So we're all going to be different physically and with, with those kinds of things. But spiritually, we are all coming towards a oneness, a sameness, because we're all trying to put on the same clothes of Jesus's characteristics. And the very first article of spiritual clothing is compassion, right? Compassion. What is that? Just love that causes us to act. Like if people have more compassion in the world, there would be no argument about wearing a mask because if more people had compassion and mercy, then you're thinking about other people more than yourself more than it's uncomfortable, I don't like it, I can't breathe, it's hot, blah, blah, blah. But what about your compassion for somebody else? A lot of the things that we do are not for self, it's for the other person. That's what Christianity is all about, doing for the other person. Um, and above all these things, put on love, which binds us together. I Nope, I skipped somewhere. Oh, so. Then in verse 13 says, forgive as the Lord forgave you. I have to go back and I thought I put it in there. So bear with each other, forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another, forgive as the Lord forgave you. I like that. And what I like to do is apply that to a lot of different characteristics. Like we're supposed to forgive as the Lord forgives us, which is great. But what about if we were patient as the Lord is patient with us? What if we were not quick to condemn other people like the Lord is not, like we want the Lord not to be quick to come condemn us? What if we were able to listen to others like we want the Lord to listen to us? And finally, love like we want God to love us. That's, that's an awesome, awesome task. But I think it's more than just love. It's all God's characteristics. We need to figure out how can we apply that same thing. Just like we want, we want God to forgive us and we want God to love us and we want God to be patient with us. How do we clothe ourselves with those characteristics so that we can treat others the same way that we want God to treat us? Okay, next slide. Okay. Love this verse. Verse 15 says, peace, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. And I put this, this slide up. It says, just breathe. Because when I think about peace, I think about breathing. It causes me to just stop and take a deep breath. And breathe because why? Because I know God's got this. That's really what peace is about. I know God's got this. We are not in peace when we start worrying about everything. Um, but I can have peace when I can focus on and say, I don't need to worry about these things. God's got it. So just breathe. Just keep your mind focused on God, knowing he has all the answers to everything that's going on. I, had a, I heard a minister recently say, peace is different from quiet. Hmm. Because when the leaders of the country call for peace, what they're really calling for is stop fighting and be quiet. Go back to your homes and live life peaceably, quietly, like don't bring up. <laughs> but the the preacher made the point, sometimes we have to be loud and fight for peace, for peace for our country because people are hurting and, and peace that comes when we are fighting for the peace that comes when all men are treated equally, right? Peace of God, that, that's my anchor, right? That's what I hold on to is, is peace. Like justice is love, so we can fight for that. Anything that's based in love, we need to be loud about um, so it's not about just being quiet, but seeking peace and justice and joy and equality for everybody is definitely, I believe, um, a Christ-like endeavor. So this peace of God, this is, this is my anchor. Like it's the conviction that, that God's got this. 
I don't have all the answers regarding all the things that are going on in this world, but, but God does. So that gives me peace. It's my focal point when everything else seems like just to be in chaos. This thought allows me to take a deep breath and let go of anxiety about what the future may hold. Um, and so this is another question that I, I want us to think about. Um, what is your anchor? Like what helps you to not be so anxious? What, what, what's your anchor? Is it, is it joy or what is it spiritually that helps you come back to your spiritual center, to your spiritual satisfaction? Again, just something, something to think about. Okay. And then in, in the verse it says, and we cannot forget to be, to be thankful. Um, I found this, this do everything in the name of Jesus Christ. Verse 17 says, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And when I saw this bouquet of flowers, it made me think that, you know, when someone does something nice for you, that's why we sometimes give flowers. Um, and then I thought, well, this verse says, whatever you do in word or deed. So it's like us living our life is a way of giving Jesus Christ a bouquet of flowers for what he did for us. That's an awesome thought. So let your words and your actions be a symbol of thanksgiving to Jesus for what he has done and continues to do for you. Just makes me think about my life differently. That if I am thankful for everything that Jesus has done for me, then my life, that's what I think, what Romans 12 and 1, our life is a living sacrifice. But this verse makes me think that our life, my life can be like giving a bouquet of flowers to Jesus. It's because to say thank you, that's my reasonable service, just living a life that for, for Jesus to know that his, his life, what he did was not in vain. It was not wasted on me. Um, now when I think of this verse to where it says, whatever you do, I always think, really? Whatever I do? Like, like, like what if I'm going to the bathroom? What if I'm sleeping? <laughs> All of that? Do you really mean whatever I do? And it's something to think about because I guess there's a way to do things in a way that's Christ-like and things in a way that's not Christ-like. But I don't have the answers to all of those whatevers, but definitely in word, like does every word out of your mouth bring glory to God? Is everything said with love? Are your words to build up or to tear down somebody else? So definitely I can, I see it with words and a lot of actions for sure. This is my lifelong challenge. And as I learn to filter my mouth, I end up not talking much, aloud anyway. Like there's a lot of stuff going on in my head and I, and I thank God that he has strengthened that muscle in my brain that stops my mouth from just blurting out everything that my brain thinks and it forces me to ask like, will this thought be helpful? Will this person feel encouraged? Will they feel discouraged? I remember a time in my life where I, those thoughts were nowhere in. I just opened my mouth, whatever came out. And I made a lot of enemies that way. And so I thank God that he has, again, developed that muscle and through prayer and practice and all of that focused on, for, of me focusing on it, that he is helping me learn to, to speak, that all my words, I strive. Of course, I'm, we all fall. That's why I'm continually putting to death <laughs> that sin. Okay, so... The next part of this chapter, the last part of the chapter, really goes into um, relationships. Um, so 18 through 25, it says, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting for those who belong to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, never treat them harshly. Children, always obey your parents for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not aggravate your children or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything you do. Try to please them all the time, not just when they're watching you. Serve them sincerely because of your reverent fear of the Lord. Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as you reward, uh, 
as your reward and that the master you are serving is Christ. But if you do what is wrong, you will be paid back for the wrong you have done for God has no favorites. Um, so I'm not going to go verse by verse because <laughs> I don't want to talk about wives submit yourself. We've talked about the lot a lot. It, it's there. It is correct. But I want to talk about in verse, um, now I have another slide. So I think it's really talking about relationships. The things that he's talking about towards the end applies to all relationships. It applies to husbands and wives, children and parents, fathers and children, employees and employers. It applies to all of that. And starting in verse 22, where it says, not with eye service. Um, do it not only when their eye is on you to win their favor. So whatever we do, in whatever relationships we do what, that we have, it's not about pleasing that other person. It's about pleasing God. So not for others to see or to get their approval or only working when the boss is watching or only being nice when that person is in the room or only thinking about that person or, or thinking about the words only when, that, when you're with that person. But it's, it's about relationships with everyone. I know my son came home with this word, uh, the definition of integrity and what he learned in school that the definition of integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is watching. And that kind of applies to us today that in every relationship, whatever we're doing, we're doing it um, as that bouquet of flowers to God, not for that other person. And so if we are doing everything we can with a sincerity of heart, the next part of the cha of chapter of verse 22 says singleness of heart with respect and love to God. So if we're doing it sincerely because we love God, if we're in this relationship and treating this person, whoever it is, with respect and love and honor, whether it's your spouse or your children or coworkers, but you're doing and you're in this relationship and you're acting sincerely and genuinely without any ulterior motives or without any hypocrisy, then God is pleased. And that's what's most important. Having your heart focused on pleasing God in your relationships with reverence and obedience to God. I mean, think about to the wives. It's, it's a different relationship if you say, I submit to you, husband, because God said I have to. And I submit to you, husband, because I thank God for making me a woman. I thank God for the role of wife that he has blessed me with. And I trust God in this relationship. It's different um, to, for husbands. Where they could say, I provide for you, and therefore, you know I love you, and I'm not abusive to you, so you should be happy. Or I thank God for the gift of my wife and I commit to love you, love you by honoring and protecting you, right? To employees, how you choose to do your work affects your attitude, right? I'm only gonna work hard when I know this boss is looking or I'll work hard to the best of my ability always because I know God is watching. I had a, a coworker tell me one time because uh, we have quotas of how many people we're supposed to interact with daily and um, I remember her telling me, Marcy, don't do more than they tell you to do because they're not paying us enough to do more than what they already told me to do. And, and I really didn't like that attitude because to me, she, it was a bare minimum attitude. It was, if you tell me to do five, then I'm just going to do five, even though I have plenty more time to do 10, whatever it is. But I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to reach the quota. I'm not trying to do the best I can all the time. And as Christians, our job is to do the best we can all the time because we're not working for that employee or that employer worth working for the Lord. Um, and then verse 23 says, whatever you do again, work at it with all your hearts as working for the Lord, not for men. And whenever I think about heart, I think about math, Mark uh, 12 and 30. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And this verse, uh, it'll carry you through every relationship if you can stop looking at the other person in the relationship and see only God. And as I, kinda, as I read these verses and I think about the heart, I, I see God as like a heart surgeon. He's, 
always showing us areas of our heart that need to be repaired or dark spots that need to be cut out in order for the love of Christ to grow in its stead. Right? So what do you do in relationships? What you do in your relationships is not dependent on what the other party does, right? It takes humility to not respond the same way someone else is treating you in that relationship. Because remember, the goal is not to please the other person, but to please God. And so if the goal is to please God, then the other person will always receive your best treatment. Uh, so, so I believe that the ultimate, like the highest level of spirituality is really to allow allow someone to to use and misuse you like knowing and believing that god's going to fight for you or defend you or god may allow you to die because that's his will like that's that's the ultimate 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 level of spiritual spirituality or spiritual satisfaction because when you think about jesus's life he allowed himself to be killed even though he didn't deserve it at all he had no sin um, and again, this is like humanly impossible. It's totally impossible to know that someone is taking advantage of you or someone is using you and to allow it to happen because our natural carnal self is to protect self, is to defend self, is to not allow people to take advantage of us, to not allow people to hurt us. And I'm not saying just stand there and let people beat all on you, but I'm saying spiritually, Sometimes we have to allow things like that to occur so that we can show the love of Christ to somebody else, right? That, that again, comes back to the power of the Holy Spirit. It is only through the power of the Holy Spirit that we can allow someone to belittle us or to misuse us or to mistreat us um, and not fight back and depending on um, the Lord to fight your battles. And I'm not talking about you know, relationships where there's, they're abusive. I'm not, I'm, I'm not talking about stay in a physically abusive relationship or all of those things, but if all of those things are equal and you're in a relationship where, you know, it's not always nice or you don't feel like somebody's treating you well or something, you have to stop and think, but if I stay in this relationship, will I be able to show Jesus to this person? It's just a question. And I think that I'm not there at all. And that's where the Holy Spirit comes in to help. I, I struggle with the thought of allowing somebody to take advantage of me. First Peter 3 and 17 says, it's better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil doing. So this point, um, it doesn't promote like, I'm not saying like be apathetic or do nothing, like just sit back and God's gonna take care of everything. But this act, this, is, this comes from a foundation of love, not hate. Like shout for justice because justice is based in love. Um, so I wanna go on to verse 24. I think I have a slide here. Okay. Because, oh, I skipped this slide. <laughs> Colossians 3, 23 and 24, whatever you do. We talked about this already. So the next slide is a question. So what hinders you from reaching for spiritual self-sacrifice? That's an interesting question. Like what, this, this level, remember this whole thing was about putting on Christ, putting on those clothes, those characteristics of Christ so that we can reach higher, transcend to a level where we're reaching for spiritual satisfaction more than physical satisfaction. But a lot of self gets in the way. A lot of self gets in the way. So what hinders you from reaching for spiritual self-sacrifice? What, what hinders you from reaching or gaining that peace and that calm and that joy and those characteristics of God, those fruit of the Holy Spirit that we need to continue in this race? Um, I think that is... Yes, the last slide. So we can, we're going to unmute right now. I said a lot.